Have you ever had somebody tell you that the books of the New Testament, they were chosen by the Emperor Constantine or a powerful bishop hundreds of years later was the one who selected the books that we find in the New Testament? And have you ever wondered if maybe they're right? Maybe the books that you read in the New Testament were chosen by somebody hundreds of years after the time of Jesus. Well, here's what I want you to learn in this session that the canon of the New Testament was created by God. That is to say that when these books were written in the beginning, they were written in such a way that the people knew that they were authoritative writings from the very beginning. And that yes, there were writings that were questioned later, but these writings, even those that were questioned later, were recognized for a very particular reason, not because of a powerful bishop, not because of an emperor, but because they could be traced to eyewitnesses of the risen Lord Jesus. years ago, if you had asked somebody at church, how are the books of the New Testament chosen? I'm fairly certain you would have gotten the same response every single time. And I think the response would have been, I have no idea. I have no idea how the books of the New Testament were chosen. But now that's changed. If somebody happens to have read, say, the Da Vinci Code, they might say something like this. Well, it was Constantine that chose the books of the New Testament. Constantine was the creator of the canon. Because here's what Dan Brown has to say in the Da Vinci Code. The Bible as we know it today was collated by the pagan Roman emperor Constantine the Great. And even Newsweek magazine has picked up on this. In a recent article in Newsweek, here's what it was claimed. Constantine changed the course of Christian history, ultimately influencing which books made it into the New Testament. Now the claim that Constantine chose the books of the New Testament, it's a ridiculous claim that can be very easily debunked. Because if you look at the text that Christians were quoting as scripture before the reign of Constantine and after the reign of Constantine, they're quoting the same books as scripture. And so clearly Constantine didn't make the choice of which books are in the New Testament. Now, if you ask somebody how the books of the New Testament were chosen, and they've recently read the skeptical writings of a scholar such as Bart Ehrman, here's what they might say. They might say there was a powerful bishop named Athanasius, and he's the one who chose the books in the canon, because that's what Bart Ehrman seems to imply in one of his books. Here's what Bart Ehrman has to say. We are able to pinpoint the first time that any Christian of record listed the 27 books of our New Testament as the books of the New Testament. The author of this list was the powerful Bishop of Alexandria named Athanasius in the year 367. Now, Athanasius was indeed a powerful bishop. He'd clashed on five separate occasions with emperors and ended up being sent into exile. He was short and he was dark skinned, so much so that his enemies called him the Black Dwarf. Now, other people called him Athanasius Contra Mundum, Athanasius against the world. But despite his power, Athanasius was not creating a canon in the year 367 when he wrote this Easter letter to the churches that listed particular books of the New Testament. Now we will learn later on why Athanasius wrote this letter and what he was actually doing at this point. But if you were to come up to me and ask me when the New Testament canon was created and who chose the books, here's the answer I would give you. The canon wasn't created by any human being at all. You see, early Christians recognized a canon that God had already created. And this canon was created in the first century when God himself inspired these writings of the New Testament. But the question still remains, when was it that Christians recognized these books as the canon of the New Testament? Was it the time of Constantine? Was it in the time of Athanasius? Was it sometime much later still? And here's what I want to suggest in this session. Except for a few texts on the fringes of the New Testament canon, Christians throughout the world recognize the books of the New Testament as scripture from the time that they were written. To put it in another way, the canon existed from the time that the books were written and the writers of the New Testament, they knew it. 
It's clear from Paul's writings, for example, that he knew what he was writing were authoritative texts for the people of God. You can see that in the opening verses, for example, of the book of Galatians, where Paul says this, Paul, an apostle, not sent from any human being or by any human being, but through Jesus Christ. Now, Paul here identifies himself as an apostle, and it's important that we understand what Paul means by apostle. The apostles, at least as he is using it here, were eyewitnesses of the risen Lord Jesus who were commissioned by Jesus to testify to others about his kingdom and to apply his teachings in the churches. And so Paul calls himself an apostle and he said it wasn't from any human being or through any human being, but through Jesus Christ that he was sent. And on the basis of this claim, Paul says to them, he commands the Galatians, in fact, to return to the gospel of God's grace. Now, what's clear from that is that Paul recognized he is writing authoritative texts for the people of God. We also see Paul's clear recognition that he is writing authoritative texts for the people of God in 1 Corinthians, where he says in 1 Corinthians 14, what I am writing to you is a command from the Lord. So it's not as if when Peter and Paul were martyred and entered into their heavenly glory, that Paul looked at Peter and said, those writings were authoritative. I didn't know that. So yours were too? No, they weren't having this discussion of figuring out suddenly that they were writing something that was authoritative for the people of God. They knew when they wrote these texts that they were writing authoritative texts for Christians in the first century and in centuries yet to come. Now, even Peter recognizes this very clearly in 2 Peter chapter 3, where Peter says that there are ignorant and unstable people that are distorting Paul's writings. And then he says, as they do the other scriptures. And so Peter clearly knew that the texts that Paul had written were scripture. But it's not just the letters in the New Testament that were written with a sense of being authoritative for the people of God. The authors of the Gospels also presented their writings as authoritative. So if we were to go to the Gospels, we would find, for example, in Mark, that it starts out with the statement that this is the Gospel of of Jesus Christ. We find that Matthew's gospel, for example, it begins with genealogies that clearly link it to the Old Testament and almost present Matthew's gospel as a continuation of the Old Testament. Luke linked his words to eyewitnesses of the risen Lord Jesus in the very first chapter. And John declared himself in John chapter 21 to be the disciple who is testifying and now has written these things. The authors of the gospels clearly saw, clearly knew, that they were writing texts that were authoritative for the people of God. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, he puts it this way, the authors of the New Testament were conscious of a unique vocation to write Jesus-shaped, spirit-led, church-shaping books as part of their strange or unique first-generation calling. Now there's a discussion that survives from the second century AD, and here's what it shows clearly. It shows that the reason certain texts were recognized as part of the canon that God had created was not the word of a powerful bishop. It wasn't the emperor. It wasn't even the church's preferences. You see, this little document is known as the Muratorian Fragment. And in the second half of the second century, apparently there were some Christians who wanted to read as part of their weekly gatherings a text known as the Shepherd. Now, let's remember for a moment in the second century AD how important it was which texts were read when the church gathered on the first day of the week. So they would gather together and read from the Old Testament and from the text that would become the New Testament. And they were reading these to people who at least 80%, maybe more of these people, were illiterate. They couldn't read at all. So this was their only opportunity to hear the words that God had inspired. So the books that were read in their weekly gatherings were very important texts. And so some people wanted to read this book called The Shepherd. Now, there's nothing particularly heretical about the shepherd. It's a little strange, but there's nothing that is wrong with it in terms of agreeing with many, many other things that were believed in the church at this time. But it was rejected as a book that could be read publicly in the churches, and here's why. In the Muratorian fragment, it says, 
It says, Hermas wrote the shepherd very recently in our own times in the city of Rome when his brother Pius was the bishop of Rome. So it should be read, but not publicly to the people in the church. It does not belong among the prophets because their number is already complete. Neither does it belong among the apostles because it was written after their time. Now, it seems like the Muratorian fragment may be from the proceedings of some sort of a gathering in the second century church. So we can imagine for a moment, and let's think of it a little bit imaginatively, that we've got a group of people gathered together, and some of them have said, well, there's this book called The Shepherd that a lot of our people think is a really great text, and it may come from the time of the apostles. But then some of the others said, no, 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 no. I remember that text. I've heard about that text. You remember Bubba Hermas. Bubba Hermas wrote this text all the way back just not too long ago when his brother was the Bishop of Rome. And another one said, well, I didn't know that he wrote that text. You think he really, yes, I know he wrote that text. He wrote it out at a coffee shop on the other side of the Palatine Hill. Now, I could be being a little bit imaginative in that particular reconstruction, coming from having been at a lot of church business meetings in Oklahoma and Kentucky, but it had to have something like that, where they were discussing this particular text and they were trying to, to find out the right information and somebody had the information that no, this can't be recognized as part of our recognized text that we're reading, and why? It's because it doesn't come from the time of the apostles. We know who wrote it. His name was Hermas. He lived in the city of Rome. His brother was the bishop of Rome. And so this is not to be used, why? Not because an emperor doesn't like it, not because a bishop doesn't like it, but simply because it comes after the time of the apostles. It comes after their time, and therefore this is not to be a book that's recognized among the texts that we read week by week by week to shape people into the image of Christ. So what do we learn from the Muratorian fragment? That less than a century after the last book of the New Testament was written, Christians already had a clear understanding of how they would recognize the authoritative texts for the people of God. And their leaders saw nothing wrong with reading books that were written after the time of the apostles, but these books were not to be read in the weekly gatherings among the texts that were authoritative for God's people. They weren't to be read in the church's gatherings. Even in the earliest stages of Christian history, Christians were known as people who treasured and taught from a clearly defined set of authoritative texts. One of the clearest examples happened on July 17th in the year 180 AD. This was a time when following Jesus Christ was a capital crime in the Roman Empire. During one particular persecution, 12 Christians from the village of Scillium were brought before the Roman proconsul in Carthage, North Africa. The proconsul urged them to save themselves from death. He told them that all they needed to do was to swear by the genius of our Lord the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. But Sparatus, one of the Christians, replied, I do not recognize the empire of this world. I serve the God whom no human being has seen. He alone is the king of all kings and the emperor over every nation. The proconsul pressed Sparatus further and asked, What do you have in your copsa? Now, a copsa was a case for books that could be carried on a person's back. It was an ancient book bag. And when asked what he kept in his copsa, Sparatus said simply, Books, and the letters of Paul, a righteous man. When Sparatus mentioned books, he most likely meant the codices of the four Gospels and perhaps the Acts of the Apostles. So Sparatus probably carried with him the writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, at least the letters of Paul, and perhaps the Acts and other letters that he didn't mention by name. Moments after Sparatus revealed the contents of his copsa as books and the letters of Paul, the proconsul declared the fate of these twelve believers. Since these twelve have obstinately persisted in the Christian religion, it is decided that they will be put to the sword. And that's when the twelve replied, Thanks be to God. This day we will be witnesses in heaven. And they were. That day in the city of Carthage, seven men and five women from the village of Scillium were martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. Years later, a basilica was built in Carthage to commemorate their faith. St. Augustine of Hippo once preached in this church building. So what does this little incident reveal about the development of the New Testament? In the sacrifice of the skeleton martyrs, what we see clearly is that even in the first centuries of Christian faith, Christians were people whose lives were shaped by the written word of God. So did every Christian everywhere immediately recognize the same books as authoritative? 
Well, for the most part, yes. For the most part, yes. You see, most of the books in the New Testament were always recognized in the churches and were never questioned. So the four Gospels and Acts, the writings of Paul, at least the first letter of John, and probably Revelation, always recognized by the churches, always known among them that these come from the apostles, the eyewitnesses of Jesus, or close associates of these eyewitnesses of Jesus. So there's about 20 books, and let's suppose just for a moment that only those 20 books that were never questioned, that were always known to come from apostolic eyewitnesses and their associates, what if those happened to have been the only books that truly were authoritative for the people of God? Now, if that happened to be the case, do you know that every essential belief that we believe about God would remain intact? In other words, these 20 or so books that were always recognized as authoritative in the churches, those 20 or so books have in them every belief that is essential to trusting Jesus and to following him. But these aren't the only texts in our New Testaments, of course. There's 27 texts in our New Testament. And what about those others? How were they recognized as canon? It didn't happen because of a vote. It wasn't because of an emperor or a bishop and because they liked the book. Rather, these books were recognized because they could be traced to an eyewitness or to someone closely connected to an eyewitness of the risen Lord Jesus in the apostolic era. And so when someone was uncertain, they could compare the book in question to the text that they knew for certain came from an eyewitness. There's a story that survives another one from the late second century that gives us a glimpse into how this happened. There was a man named Serapion, and Serapion was the overseer or the bishop of the churches in and around Antioch in Syria. And the Christians in a nearby village called Hrasus, they were arguing over a text called the Gospel of Peter. Now, I don't think that these Christians in Rossus were wanting to read the Gospel of Peter as part of their weekly readings of authoritative texts. They were probably more arguing about whether they could use this book for devotional reading, we might say. These Christians had the four Gospels that they knew were authoritative Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But they're arguing about this particular text. And either way, Serapion approved. He said, if this is the only thing that threatens to produce ill feelings among you in your church, let it be read. Just go ahead, read this book called the Gospel of Peter. But then Serapion read the book for himself. And as he read the book, he quickly regretted his decision to tell them, go ahead and read this particular text. Now there's a fragment of a letter from Serapion that survives to us today. It's copied in a fourth century history book. And his letter was written right before he headed to Rossus, this church, to correct the error that he had allowed them to read this particular text. Now, imagine with me just a moment, when you get one of those texts from your children when you're away from home, maybe you've run to the grocery store, left the kids at home, and you get one of those texts. And the text is something like, there's water pouring through the ceiling of the living room, and we're not sure if we ought to be concerned about this. And you send that text back and you call them, and you say, I'm going to be right there, almost breath. Well, that type of a breathlessness is what we hear in Serapion's letter to this church after he realizes what's really in this book, the Gospel of Peter. Here's what he says to them. Now that I have learned from what has been told me, I will hurry to come to you again. Brothers, expect me shortly. So what was it? that Serapion found in this so-called gospel, the gospel of Peter, that caused him to send this letter priority mail to this church and then run out, jump on his donkey and head to this village of Rossus. Simply this, here's what he said. He said, most of the contents of this book agree with the orthodox account of the Savior, but we found some things that were inconsistent. And what was inconsistent, according to Serapion, was that there were some sections in this book that could suggest that Jesus wasn't fully human. Remember that according to Orthodox Christian belief, Jesus is fully human and fully divine. And there were some portions in this book that he felt could suggest that Jesus wasn't fully human. And so Serapion declared rightly that this book could not have come from the Apostle Peter. It couldn't have come from the Apostles because it disagreed with the testimony of the Apostles. And in fact, Serapion was correct. 
This book that masqueraded as the Gospel of Peter was in fact a fictional account that was written much later, way after the time of the apostles. And here's what Serapion says about the writings that they receive and that they recognize. He said, we receive Peter and the rest of the apostles, and he's speaking here not of Peter and the apostles themselves, because obviously they're long dead. He's speaking of their writings. And he says, we receive Peter and the rest of the apostles just as we would receive Christ himself. But those writings that are falsely inscribed with their name, we reject, knowing that no such writings have been handed down to us. So Serapion and his churches received the words of the apostles as the very words of Jesus himself. He says, we receive Peter and the rest of the apostles as we would receive Christ. So he recognizes the authority of the apostolic eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ and receives those words as the words of Jesus himself. But not only that, Serapion and his churches, they had writings that in his words had been handed down to them that had the orthodox account of the life of Jesus. Now, what does that let us know? It lets us know that Serapion possessed certain texts that were recognized as authoritative and he without question knew that these had come from apostolic eyewitnesses and close associates of eyewitnesses of the risen Lord Jesus. And so he took those writings and when he wanted to determine whether the gospel of Peter really came from Peter, whether it was really an authoritative account, whether it was really trustworthy, what he did was to compare the gospel of Peter, this so-called gospel with the writings that he knew came from the apostles, the eyewitnesses of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when Serapion saw that the gospel of Peter disagreed with the apostolic writings that he knew came from authoritative sources, he knew they came from reliable and trustworthy eyewitnesses, what did he do? Well, he headed immediately to Rossus to repair the damage by getting rid of this text, by making sure that the Christians there were not reading it as any sort of authoritative text. And he recognized very clearly as he compared it with the other text that this could not have been written by the Apostle Peter. And in fact, he was right. It was written much later. So why was it that Serapion completely rejected this text and said that it wasn't to be read at all by the people in his church as having any sort of authority? Well, first off, he recognized very clearly that it didn't come from an apostle or a close associate of an apostle. It didn't come from anybody who had seen the risen Lord Jesus. It did not come from the era of the apostles. He recognized that. And not only that, he recognized that it didn't agree with the text that he knew had been written by apostles and had been written by associates of the apostles and that were trustworthy as books that were authoritative for the people of God. So let's go back to what we talked about earlier. Remember that we said that about 20 books had never been questioned. There was never a time that anyone questioned that these indeed came from apostles and close associates of the apostles. But then there were another seven books that were questioned at times, or at least people weren't aware that they came from apostles. What about those books? Now, taking all that we've learned together, what we've seen very clearly is that the foundation for whether books were recognized as part of the New Testament canon or not was whether they could be connected clearly to an apostle, an eyewitness of the risen Lord Jesus, or to a close associate of one of those eyewitnesses. And so in the end, Christians recognized that, for example, with the book of Hebrews, that even though Paul probably didn't write the book of Hebrews, it was clearly connected to Paul. It mentions, after all, in chapter 13 of Hebrews, Timothy, who was sort of Paul's protege in the faith. James and Jude, for example, they were half-brothers of Jesus who saw the risen Lord Jesus and trusted in him. So their letters, the letters of James and Jude, were recognized as among the apostolic authorities, the apostolic eyewitnesses. And they recognized that the letters attributed to Peter, 1st and 2nd Peter, originated with Simon Peter, the apostle of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And that the author of the 2nd and 3rd letters of John, as well as Revelation, that he was an eyewitness and a follower of Jesus Christ. And so remember that Easter letter we talked about earlier that Athanasius wrote in the year 367? The one that supposedly where Athanasius is the one who set the canon for the very first time? Well, Athanasius at that point was not creating a canon. What Athanasius was doing was stating a consensus. 
And this consensus that the church had, had always included for the books of the New Testament, a core of 20 or so books that were never questioned, that were always known from the very beginning to have come from apostolic eyewitnesses of the risen Lord Jesus or of close associates of these eyewitnesses. And this consensus also included a handful of books that had been previously unknown or uncertain in some areas. But it had now become clear by that point that these texts also could be traced back to first century testimony about Jesus. These books, Hebrews, the letters of James and Peter and John and Jude, that these letters also came from the first century and came from people who had seen the risen Lord Jesus or those connected with those who had. And in all of this, nobody was making a decision by saying, what does Athanasius think about the canon? Or what does Constantine think about the canon? Their question from the very beginning, we've seen very clearly, is can this text be traced back to an apostolic eyewitness of the risen Lord Jesus? And so we see that the canon of the New Testament was not created by any human being. The canon of the New Testament was created by God as he inspired these books, and it was recognized later by the people of God as having the authority that it had always had because God himself had inspired these writings. And most of these writings were recognized from the moment that they were written, and a few were recognized later, but in every case, the reason they were recognized as the canon, as the authoritative text for the people of God, was because they could be connected by, to the people who were commissioned by Jesus himself to spread his word throughout the world. So, um, just, I've been watching a great video series, and um, what is, I, I, you know, I'm subscribed to this one thing, and it was the one I showed you last week where the guy saying, hey, you know, a lot of people don't believe in Jesus, and I thought that was a good one. Yeah. And it was interesting because he had somebody question him, like, give another question. And I thought this was a no, you know, I was like, I'm going to show this one as well. Fortunately, he edited this one down himself, so I didn't have to edit anything down. It's about four minutes long, but it's a really cool question because we will get people who ask crazy questions because they want to disprove the Bible or disprove God. So here's another video from the same guy. Hope you enjoy it. I just thought it was really a good thing for us to watch. In the previous episode, I brought up a list of the names of the early apostles, and this list in itself is apparently a point of some controversy. I came across this meme many years ago, and it says, how did Jesus find guys named Peter, John, James, Matthew, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, and Simon in the Middle East? The point it's making is that these aren't the kind of names that you'd expect to find in the Middle East 2,000 years ago. These are English sounding names. So I guess this meme writer is trying to cast doubt on the historical nature of the Bible, perhaps saying that the Bible must have been written by English speakers maybe, who had no concept of what a Hebrew name actually sounded like. Okay, this question has a very straightforward answer. The names that we know the apostles by today in the English speaking world are not the original names. The names that we know the apostles by today are just English translations or renderings of the original names. So these are the original names of the early apostles. Peter was known as Kephas, which is Aramaic, it means stone. Andrew would have been known as Andraus, which is actually Greek in origin. James would have been known as Yaakov, John Yohanan, Simon Shimon. Uh, Judas would have been known as Yehuda, Matthew Maticha, Thomas Town, Philip Philippos, that's another Greek origin name. Then we have Bartholomew, who would have been known as Bartalme, that's an Aramaic name. Then we have Thaddeus, who would have been known as Tadai or Levavia. And then Matthias, again, probably would have been called Matija. Apologies for these pronunciations, any Hebrew speakers. I'm just hearing my Scottish accent saying these words, Matija. Probably sounds nothing like that. But you get the point. We've just translated these Hebrew, these Greek, these Aramaic names into their English versions. That's all we've done. And actually on that point, it's worth saying that Jesus himself wasn't even originally called Jesus either. So Jesus is just an English translation of the original Hebrew name, which is Yeshua. Yeshua became Yesus in Greek, which then became Jesus in English. 
Now, this is a perfectly normal thing to do, and every country, therefore, translates these names differently according to their own language. So, for example, we render the name Johannen as John in English, but if you went to a Germanic or a Dutch speaking country, it would become Johann, Johannes, Jan, Jens, or Hans. These names all come from exactly the same root. If you went to France, it would become Jean. If you went to Italy, it would become Giovanni. In Spanish speaking countries, it becomes Juan. In Portuguese, it becomes Jao. These are all the same names from the same root, but just render differently by the various world languages. And that's why we in English speaking countries use the English versions of the names, because we speak English. And that's all there is to it. So this has been Mark for the Fuel Project, or Marcos, or Marcus, or Marco, or Marcus, or Mark, or Marku, or Marek, or Malaco, or that. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, yeah I hope you enjoyed that. But it is true because somebody will try and trip you up. Yeah. You know, matter of fact, when you saw the little meme that he showed, it was somebody trying to make a mock out of the Bible. Yeah. yeah. He was trying to say, you know, hey, you know, we, we, we found the flaw in the Bible. It's not really a flaw in the Bible. Again, you know, yeah, I remember growing up when I was in high school, I took Spanish, so the first thing you learn is your name. You know, like, I'm Esteban. You know, I get it, you know? So that's all he's saying. But what happens is, again, the world wants to trip us up. They want to make us look foolish. And God's like, I'm not going to make a fool out of me. Those, you know, it, it just, it, it's just amazing how this works out. So, Let's get into our slides. Uh, the first thing, and this is very common information. Tonight's going to be a lot of common information, but as, as I tell the kids, when I talk to the kids, we're going over a lot of this stuff, even with the little kids. We're doing it on a more of a kid's level, not as intense as you're getting. <laughs> what do you, you're laughing because you know, right? I know. Veronica? What I'm telling you is my bills. I've learned so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our kids, we're trying to teach our kids how they can believe the Bible. So what you guys are getting, while well, it's a little bit more intense, our kids are getting the same lessons. And I think it's important. So if I'm covering over some stuff, you know, understand this. Most of you may know this. Some of you may not. And you know what happens? There's, there's nothing wrong with not knowing. Because now you're learning. And there's nothing wrong with that. Some of you may be new Christians coming into the faith. Some of you may not have, like, you might have never cracked the Bible before even as a Christian. And now all of a sudden you're going, I don't know God's Word. Where do I start? Well, this is where you start. That's what it's all about, getting to know God's Word. You know, as we become Christians, our first job is just basically that we want to know God. And so how do we get to know God? We can pray to Him and we get to read His Word. Let's get a handle on his word. I mean, the Bible even tells us that we need to study the Bible and get into the Bible so that we can just know how to handle Scripture wisely. Okay? So, we start off with the simple thing that many of you may know. Is that the New Testament has how many books? 27. 27 books. Very common answer. And that's great if you know it. Is there anybody, and I'm not trying to embarrass this, anybody that that's really the first time you're starting to know these things generally? Good. So most of you know this stuff, so a lot of it is review. It's all good to know. Because I throw the math question out to the kids, and I say that there's 66 books in the Bible. And then I say to them, how many books are in the Old Testament then? And you're all getting calculators out right now. <laughs> 39. So it's good to know. So... And we see that they were written, the New Testament books were written between A.D. 45 and A.D. 100. Just so you know, A.D. now is after Christ's birth, okay? So the numbers are starting to go up instead of backwards, okay? So that's important to know that Christ has come. And we're 45 years now into things between 45 and 100 years. So if you think about this, and I want you to keep this in mind, and I'm going to go to the list of books here. 
that we have the Gospels, Paul's epistles, and the general epistles, okay? When you're looking at this, think about this. We're looking basically at maybe, you know, 55 years from when it was, you know, when people were starting to write the New Testament to when they think it was done. 55 years is not a long time. So we are very close to the time when Jesus was alive. Think about that. I mean, if you think about Jesus, a lot of people place him at, like, was it, 3 or 4 AD? Really, I, like, that always confused me, really. If it's supposed to be based on when Jesus was born. Three or four years on. Somebody figure that one out for me and let me know. I would love to know that. You know, why did they start at three or you know, So, But if you think about that, Jesus, when he lived for how many years? 33. 33 years. And if we're looking at starting at 83, 84, and you add 33, so come on, give me the math now. What number? Okay. Now, how close are we to 45? We're within a few years. So we still, as we heard um, Tim speaking, we, we are still within a time period where people are still alive. Where people are still, the witnesses are still around. They're able to know, like you go, okay, is this actually true? Well, I can just go down and ask my neighbor. He was there when it was said. Or, oh, my mom, I remember my mom telling me this when I was a little boy. Yeah, so we're still within that time period. So we think about that when we talk when we talk about the authority and inspiration of scripture. So we look at this and we see these were the books, 27 books. You recognize those books, okay? When we look at the books of the New Testament, the church leaders received the writings as, of the apostles and their close associates as canonical. Okay? Canon is from a Greek word meaning ref, uh, referring to standard of faith, the measuring. Okay? So what we're looking at is church leaders, okay, as they're looking at these scriptures that are written, they are measuring them up to our to the standard for what other gospels were, what other scriptures were, and they were all measuring up. And you saw that there were a couple other books that were written that didn't measure up. And they knew right away that based on certain things that these books belong here, these other ones, no. These books cannot belong. They're not part. You know, and they might they might have sounded good. And if you think about it, okay, we have, we have a lot of the same issues. Let me just take the biblical aspect out of it. Okay? How many of us have ever gone into a Christian bookstore and we're looking for a book on a certain topic? And you have a lot of different opinions on a lot of different topics. Yeah, which one would we agree with? So you have to be very careful because that's where you turn around and go, okay, what is scriptural? What goes with scripture? You know, you find a lot of books with a lot of opinions and a lot of people interpreting scripture their way. So you have to be very careful that we don't use the extra biblical books for the basis of anything that we do. If you want to take those books and read through them, you compare them with Scripture. If you're not sure, then what you do, you can ask, you can ask one of the pastors, ask somebody that you trust, and just say, listen, can, is this, is book, this book sound for me to read based on what Scripture says? And when all else fails, use the Bible. Okay? You can find all the advice you need in Scripture. Okay? But when we're looking at this, the church leaders, as they were looking at the books, the 27 books that they had, as they were looking at those books, they knew that they were the canon. They knew that they were the authorized. They knew that they were the inspired word of God. Uh, we'll go back and we see that. We see Matthew writing his gospel. That's a good cartoon for them. So, you re I recognize him because he has the paper plate in the back of his head. So, uh, <laughs> Oh, he's the same. The same. Okay. I'm going with the paper plate. Okay. Wow. Hopefully that wasn't too offensive. Okay. We still have. 
that Matthew there, the reading is saintly book. Uh, he must be a saint because I'm seeing he's got an angel sitting on his head. Yes. That's what the Catholics would say. Oh, okay. The guardian. Guardian? Guardian angel? Yes. 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 As opposed to the other one that goes, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, okay, you got Eat the piece of cake. No, eat the piece of cake. Really? Wasn't that a Looney Tunes? That was a Looney Tunes cartoon, I remember. So. Wow. So. When we look at this, books of the New Testament, texts that seem to have been universally recognized as authoritative from the very beginning. The four Gospels, Acts, Paul's letters, and at least one of John's letters. When we're looking at that, as you see, those are books that were passed amongst the churches, and the churches started to recognize those as the authoritative word of God. They were recognized, okay? So when we look at that, there's Emperor Constantine. He was, uh, wow. Why are you guys laying at the pictures? His mom probably thought, it's like, you know, that's a really good likeness of you. Really good. That was just like you. So, books of the New Testament, when we're looking at this, the books of the New Testament had already circulated throughout the known world by the time the Emperor Constantine allowed Christians to practice their religion freely in A.D. 313. Emperor Constantine had no impact or influence on which books became part of the Bible. When you think about that, a lot of people might say, oh, you know what, Emperor Constantine, he was the one who said, this is how the Bible will be. Understand something, Emperor Constantine was one of the first emperors who claimed to be a Christian. And that's still up for a question. That's still up for possibly a political question. Whether he was doing that just to appease the people and not necessarily Christian. Okay? So that is, again, up for debate. But we do know one thing. That he did ease up the persecution on Christianity. So if we say anything, no matter what kind of emperor, whether where his faith was at or not, we know that he eased up any of the persecution that was on Christianity. At the time before him, if you were a Christian, you might as well be either in hiding or on the run because if you were caught, you were killed. So, you have, you know, we thank God for what Emperor Constantine did. Um, keep in mind, though, as, as I researched a little bit more about him, he was a little bit, I mean, we, we, see, we see a lot of the uh, bumper stickers around, you know, that basically are saying, you know, the, that what is the, uh, the, the, the now I'm now going blank, you know, the intolerance was the, uh, the, 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 the coexist, the coexist where it has all the faiths, okay? Um, that is the type of emperor that he was. While we are recognizing that he eased up on Christianity, understand something, that he eased up on all religions. He got a little bit tougher, believe it or not, he got a little bit tougher on the Jews especially those who were persecuting those who became Christians. So he got a little stricter with them because he was trying to ease up on Christianity. But there was not, there was not the persecution that they had ever had before. So it was a little bit more universal in terms of accepting each other's faith. So that's where you're like, don't get too confused that he was like the Christian emperor. He was not. He accepted Christianity, okay? So if you want to do a little bit more research about that, that would be great. His time period was around 313 AD. Okay, books of the New Testament continued by 400 AD, so consensus that emerged throughout the churches. 27 books could be traced to the testimony of apostolic eyewitnesses and their close associates. The, this consensus was confirmed by church fathers such as Atheranius. That's consensus for this. Okay, you have, anybody got that one down? Come on, somebody give me the pronunciation. I'll let you know if you're right. Yes, exactly. You are all correct. You read well. Athanasius, Jerome, and Constantine, or Augustine, excuse me. 
Um, three church councils, including the Synod of Carthage. We heard a little bit about that in AD 397. Um, when we start to see this, we're starting to see other churches recognize that this was Scripture. We're actually seeing now the New Testament. The New Testament being shared as the New Testament. It was not just necessarily letters being given around. Now we're starting to see it as a collection of books that we look at the authority of the New Testament. A lot of space. Uh, here we have a map. If you look at it, the pink area is the expansion of Christianity in the Roman Empire. 325, again, it was Constantine. When we look at this, what I mean, if you think about this, I mean, just look at where you see where Israel is and just how it's spread. A lot of it, how many, if you would say the first spread of the gospel came early on in Christianity, was spread by who? Paul. Paul, very good. Anybody remember how many missionary journeys he went on? Three. Three, very good. And so we saw that spread across. I wish I actually had the markings on there, it doesn't. But it would be interesting to see those markings where you saw Paul's journeys. But if you look at this, this is 325 AD. We see the spread of Christianity. What is interesting, when you're getting into 400, 500 AD, the area that you see, if you see, if, if you can see where the black lines are, there's a line, black line on the bottom, and what it's doing on the outline across the top. In that whole area, by about 500 AD, that was heavily predominant with Christianity. So you saw Christianity continuing to spread and spread and spread. So we just see that happening because of just how God has just taken his scripture and has allowed people to use that. The freedom that Constantine gave Christianity. But what's also interesting when we think about this, You'd be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't be surprised, how much Christianity spreads when there's persecution. It always cracks me up that you see government after government, and you read story after story about governments that try and shut down Christianity, and all of a sudden you hear about that country having a spread of Christianity. You'd think that governments would be smart enough by now to go, listen, you know what, we're going to let Christianity go. Because I'm going to say this, this I don't want to sound anti-American, but we have one of the freest countries in the world. And our Christianities acts like because we don't have that persecution. You're, you're seeing Christianity watered down. You're seeing the gospel not shared the way it needs to be shared. It's just not happening in the United States. Whereas you hear about churches that are in other countries where there is persecution or where it's a little bit harder for you to be a Christian and you're seeing them thrive in their Christianity. So, I mean, if, if anything, we need to pray for our country. You know, it's, it's always interesting. We hear about churches, and, and we are one of those churches, that we send, you know, missions, mission groups out to other countries. And you're like, wow, maybe we should spend some time in our own country. But you know what, though? We also have a church that goes out to Kensington. We have a church that sends people around. And, you know, so we do, we are seeing that locally, we are spreading the word of God. So we're not, we are global and local. So that's really a, a great balance to have. That's important to have. You know, so a lot of churches, they don't do that. They're like, oh, no, we said, you know, we have all these missionaries going all over the world. And you're forgetting the home. So, so we get to these discussion questions. Why is it important to say that early Christians recognized the canon of Scripture instead of created it? What beliefs about God and His Word are we communicating by saying recognized instead of created? Okay, the question is, um, again, what's the importance that early Christians recognize Scripture, um, recognize scripture, the canon of Scripture instead of creating it? What's the importance of that comment? We're looking at the difference between recognizing and creating. Yes? Undiluted, yeah. You know, versus you know uh, uh, a second-hand account. Right, right. And, and You're getting close. <laughs> well, I mean, just the same way that God figured out a way to supernaturally make sure that all the sixty-six books in the 
Bible were in agreement with each other and that the Word was in fact inspired. It seems like in terms of propagating the Word between, you know, catching on with that, the fact that the Greek was exploding all over that the known world at the time early on in the first century, and then later on when, you know, Constantine pulled back a little bit and said, hey, okay, here's one of the times of birth. These were all acts of God along the way. Right. And making sure that his word was being propagated in a way that was pleasing to him. Right. You know, his hands all over. And, we're, and it's, that's great. And that's talking about the spread. But if we're talking about the books themselves that are being spread, what is the difference between something that is recognized and something that's created? They had to go to well, I know there were a lot of other books written uh, during that time, but it was a little later, maybe in the two hundred or three hundred years, that uh, did not agree with the original writings. Right. And uh, maybe 75% of them were writing the book of the head because it was only sometimes. So they had to separate the books out. Right. I had a book in the head of the book that was the most of the law books in England, which were a lot of different books. That uh, that had been made actually at Bird right. and whatnot uh, through, through the years, but they still um, we got copies of them from time to time, false teachers, false right. friends, people who wanted to be included in the canon. Right. And uh, they, had, they had to separate that all out. Okay. We're closing in on the answer. Yeah. They were eyewitness accounts that um, were memorized that they followed through history. Okay, we're getting a little bit closer. Yes? You want authenticity? We're very close. We're almost getting hot, you know? Yes? Written by, not written by humans. It was written by God. We, you are like, it's just so burning hot at this point. <laughs> that I, I would almost say that that is the actual answer. All I want to know is the difference between recognizing and creating something. The way that it's written is when you recognize it, you take two minutes out of it. Creative means that somebody may have created, not necessarily talking about that, but you always hear that you know, they came together and they wrote this book, so that means that they created it. Mm -hmm. Recognizing it means that it's inspired by God. Already recognized that somebody read it, then it was God. Right. So that's the difference. That's not created by God, but created by humans. So recognition takes the inspiration, takes man out of it. Exactly. So everything you guys said, all we're doing is recognizing God and taking man out of it. And that's the important thing because what happens then is if man, if we turn around and said man created it, then we're looking at man's word. But if men recognize it as God's word, it's a completely different ballgame altogether. Exactly. So we take all those things, the, the books that were false books that we were hearing about over here, the false books, we know that they're not. You know, they were strictly only by man. Then we have the books that we recognize as canon. Well, was that a bunch of the disciples getting together and just saying, this is what we're going to have? No. Was it the churches saying, this is what we're going to put together? No. Was it Constantine going, 27 books? That sounds like a good number. I like that. No, it wasn't. It was churches recognizing that God said, there are 27 books. That's it. Open and shut case here. And we recognize that that's what God had for us. We didn't create it. God authorized the 27 books. So that's the only difference. I mean, we're, we're a little bit playing semantics on the words, but it's important to remember that. Because when people talk to you, like, we hear this a lot. If you're talking to somebody about the Bible, oh, well, it's just a bunch of men who came up with it. No. Well, it's just a bunch of men who put it together. No. You turn around and go, guess what? God authorized it. I recognize it as God's work. And he put in there what he wanted in there. Man did not add any books. 
He's not supposed to take any books away. Okay? So that's what's important. That's why we want to make sure that you understand the difference between recognizing it as God's Word and it being created by man. Any other comments on that before we go to the next question? No, I think you guys all had great answers. You guys, it was like all dancing around because they were all right. But it was just plugging in those two words. Okay, many writings that early Christians consider helpful and beneficial are not part of the canon. What does this suggest about the New Testament books that are in the Bible? What does this suggest about the books? We have books that we know they aren't recognized. But we have books that are. What does that tell us about the books in the New Testament? There's a standard, yeah. I mean, that's basically where the word canon comes from. The measure, yes. That they were authoritative books from God Himself. Books were from God Himself. Any other comments? Yes. Okay, so the, the New Testament needs to be our foundation. And what if you want to stand on the New Testament book? must be our foundation. And once you understand the foundation and understand it, then you can add perhaps other things because you have a <coughs> that you can base on what right. those books are good, the other books are good or not, or, or should be there. Any other comments? One of the things we also have to recognize, and this is not only for the New Testament, but for the Old Testament, when we look if, if does anybody remember what the word testament can mean? Covenant. covenant. Very good. So when we look at the old covenant, it was, a, it was basically God's document for his people. Okay? Wasn't any man's lawyers going in and changing the document, putting amendments in there. Okay? So we see the 39 books of the Old Testament is God's covenant locked from beginning to end. Okay? But what we see in the New Testament, another covenant from God is locked from the beginning and end. We can't add to it or take from it. We can't change it. We're not going to bring in a lawyer, you know, to come in and say, listen, God, I want to make these changes. God's going, no, this is it. This is the new covenant, covenant that I have with you. So that's what's important for us to realize. It's like, boom, done. Anything added to it? No good. Can they be supplements? Sure. But does it change the document? Not at all. Okay? I'm sorry. That it's a a validation, the New Testament, a validation of the Old Testament. It's a, it's a fulfillment of the Old Testament. Yeah. But you wouldn't call it a validation. They, well, if you want to use the word validation, they actually validate each other. We see the Old Testament has prophecies in there that are fulfilled in the New Testament. The New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, so you're reaching back. So we actually, I mean, you see a lot of crossing over. Again, as we said from the very beginning, you can't have one without the other. You can't. And we have those who, you know, you might have those who are Jewish who stick with their Old Testament. And then you have a lot of churches, unfortunately, nowadays, that only stick with the New Testament. You put the two of them together, they work together. They are two covenants that work together. Yes, John? Yeah, I like what it says in Timothy. brings to mind, God breathed. Literally, God breathed. Yeah. Breathed in a life into those words. Yeah. You get life by reading. Exactly. They are God's words. They are breathed in. They are from God Himself. Not only the Old Testament, but the New Testament. Okay, any other comments? Okay. Long question here. Except for a few texts on the fringes of the canon, Christians throughout the world recognize the books of the New Testament as Scripture from the time they were written. How does this show God's faithfulness in giving us His Word? How should this affect our attitude towards the Bible and its impact in our lives? Again, we, if we look at the first question, it, um, Christians throughout the world recognize the books of the New Testament as Scripture from the time they were written. Okay? How does that affect us? How does that impact us? That's basically our guide book of work. Yeah. And how it's supposed to manage our lives. When we have a question about life, we go to the Bible and research the question. So there's, the answer is there, we just have to find it. 
And it is there. The okay. answers are all in there, always there. Yep. And so what we have to look at here too, when we look at the New Testament, as it was, I mean, think about this. Okay? You're not talking about the Old Testament took hundreds and hundreds of years to be filled in and written out. Here, New Testament, almost as it was being written, is being recognized as God's Word. Amen. I mean, that's, that's something pretty impactful to know that that truth of Jesus Christ and what He's done in our lives was like stamped right away. There wasn't hundreds of years questioning this and that. It was as it was coming. And what I loved about when we're, when we're looking at this, and we saw some of the verses when we were watching the video, where the verses in the New Testament refer back to the Old Testament. And that is the authority that they start connecting over. Not only do we have witnesses, okay? Not only do we have witnesses, which is one of the important things for recognizing canon, but what is important is that we see the crossover of the verses being used in the New Testament from the Old Testament. And that's giving the authority. That gives recognition. I mean, how did we understand when we're, when we're first learning about Jesus and he starts talking about fulfilling prophecy? We talked a little bit about this last week. Was when Jesus talked about he could have he could have come up with a completely different way. But what he did was he knew he was a fulfillment of Old Testament scripture and he used that to prove who he was to people. So it was recognizing. Again, here's the hard part about it. I can use the term recognize and you guys know what I mean. The world doesn't recognize that. That's the tough thing about it. We can use that, we can toss that around and we completely get it. But when we talk about the world, they don't recognize that. A lot of that also has to do with the Holy Spirit in us that we start to recognize things. Again, we don't want to feed you these classes just as information. You could take a lot of classes of philosophy. You could take biblical classes that are not Christian classes. You can go, you can go to a college. You know, understand that. You can go to a college and take biblical studies that are not Christian studies. They do teach the Bible in the secular world. But we're not talking about recognizing it as God's Word. They're looking at it from a completely different way. And right now, we know, because of the Holy Spirit in us, Amen. that we can recognize what God has done in us. It is, it is not a book. Amen. It is God's Word. It's not something somebody wrote about God. It's not something that somebody wrote about Jesus. It is God's Word. And it's God speaking to us. So that is what is important about it. That when we recognize it as God's Word, that we recognize it as something that we can use daily. Yes? I think the amazing part is that throughout time, the Bible has always been relevant, even today. Mm -hmm. so if you look at our life today, and, and compared to their life back then, there's almost nothing that's the same except we're human beings and eating, drinking, you know, whatever. But all the things, the way we treat each other, all the problems that we have, everything that goes on in society today happened years ago. Mm -hmm. Lying, cheating, stealing, how we treat each other, all the different things. Right. We're, we're all in there. It's all still true today. If people would understand and, and follow the Bible, the world would be a whole different place. One of the wisest kings ever, Solomon, said there is nothing new under the sun. Amen. Nothing new. That's it. You know, when we think about that, we, we think about everything that's going on. And, and I have, that's so funny because I have people go like, oh, what about television? That's new. Go, no. What we're talking about now is entertainment. They've always had entertainment. So let's bump it into that. Is, it, is entertainment something new? No. Everything has happened way before. Again, there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. Television just makes it easier for you to throw all the bad things out. I see all the bad things you said in So, any other comments? Yes. All that has happened, like you said, from way back, like I said.
say things are happening, not being one of the Son. Okay. The way that we are Christ in the faith, in our action, believing in Jesus Christ and accepting as our Savior. But Jesus said, I'll pray to the Father and I'll send you no more comfort, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That's what we have. And these people go to these uh, classes, biblical classes and such, but they don't believe in Christ. Right. So they don't have the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. teaching them. Right, right. They have some philosophy. We might have, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, hang-ups or whatever, telling you what is the truth and what is it. Well, it's interesting. There, there's a lot of people who know an awful lot about the Bible who don't know an awful lot about God. Yeah, exactly. There's a difference because it's about relationship. So, yes. With kind of blue mind, the first trip that I took to Israel, our guy was not a Christian. But he had all this biblical history, and, and I just kind of sat there. And I know it was the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. you know, where I was getting it from. But he's just talking about the Bible like right. it's some other book, and it's like, how do you teach that? And nothing does it. Well, and, you know, well, and we understand that because you know what? It, history is history is history, yeah. really. I mean, a lot of people could understand and study the Bible, and it's no different than American history. It's history. No different than their faiths that think it's more important to sit under a mass in Latin and not understand a word that's being said. Why? Because it's tradition. And when we get caught up in tradition, we miss out on God. You know? It's, it's just, it always amazes me. I just saw, I was passing by and uh, driving my car, and somebody had a bumper sticker on for such and such a church. And it just said, you know, we do our mass in Latin. Okay, you know, but you know what? I just understand. I can appreciate tradition. I can appreciate tradition. But I can't place my faith on tradition. My faith isn't on tradition. I like I like going into churches with the steeple. I like sitting in a pew. I like singing hymns. It's tradition. And there's nothing wrong with tradition. But you again, you can't stake your life on that. So any other comments? Yes? It touched on something last week. Uh, you mentioned in the passing that there were seven books of the Old Testament, I believe they said, that weren't wounded in the New yes. Testament. Do you have a list of those? I don't have a list of those. I can check to see if I can find what they were. And basically, it's just that they weren't. You know, it, it's just a curiosity. Yeah, it's a, it is a curiosity. You know, just because something wasn't used doesn't mean it was wrong then. You know, just to make sure you're clear by that. Talk about going over somebody's house 
who have problems and all of a sudden it's like, you know, they go and they ask for the Bible. When they pull it out, it's like dust all over it. Yeah. Is it? Hence the song title, Dust on the Mind. As opposed to Dust in the Wind, which is Curry Lindgren from Kansas, who is a born again Christian. Praise God. So, um, yes.